Well, we brought out the good furniture for our guests today. We have the uh, Coretta Scott King award-winning illustrator, Pat Cummings, and our husband, Chuku Lee, here with us today. Thanks for being here, guys. Thank you. Delighted. Yes. And they have a new book out, and it's called Beauty and the Beast. And we all know that story. We'll be uh, talking about that in a, a little while. But, you know, uh, Pat, you've had a, a long career in uh, children's books. I didn't know I wanted to do children's books. I wanted to illustrate, and I went to Pratt, and I was told, because I was getting a lot of children's book illustrations in my portfolio because I was working for the Billy Holiday Theater mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, and they do children's productions. And so I had all these children's posters, and I wanted to do books, and every professor I had said, it's impossible to get into children's books. You know, it's an impossible world to break into. And that, at 20, just seemed like a real challenge. So I went and I saw every publisher in town back in the day when they would see you, when you could sit with them and talk to them, and they would go through your portfolio and give you advice. And so I saw everybody I could possibly see. And after I'd seen everybody, I had a illustration in a newsletter and an editor at a publishing house that I had already been to called me and said, we have a book we'd like you to do. And that book was? Good News, uh -huh. Eloise Greenfield. They were reissuing Eloise Greenfield's book. And so it was, it was, and she called me up and it was like a done deal. It wasn't even like, you know, let's see your portfolio. It's like, this is a book. Mm. And, and that brings us right up to uh, Beauty and the Beast, and that's a husband and wife collaboration. It's your debut book, isn't it? Yes, in terms of children's books, picture books, yes. Right. But I, I was uh, a journalist for a number of years before this happened, and uh, I worked with a London-based publishing house called Africa Journal, and we published in French and English, and we circulated in about 50 countries throughout Africa, in the Caribbean, and in this country. And uh, that's how I got started. Right, and you were a founder of an organization. What organization the was that? The National Association of Black Journalists, which has got about 3,500 members nationally now. It's about 40 years old. And we started that organization to have more representation in the newsrooms across the country of people of color. So how did this book come about? Did you have any uh, uh, nudging from the person next to me <laughs> about doing this book? Well, it wasn't nudging so much. He, he's going to describe it a certain way. But what happened, we both loved, loved um, the Jean Cocteau film of Beauty and the Beast. You know, it's, it's just full of, you know, it's black and white, but there's a lot of mystery and magic in it. And I had an editor who said to me at one point in time, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd love to do Beauty and the Beast. And I went to the public library when the Donnell had the children's collection and found an original version. And um, Chugu had been a former diplomat mm -hmm. and he spoke French and it was written in French. And so I thought it would be lovely if he translated it and did the adaptation. Was adapting the story difficult? When she asked me to, to uh, retell the story or do the translation of the original version, so I did a little research just to get some background. And the original story of Beauty and the Beast was actually encased in a 362-page volume of stories about witchcraft and sorcery and, and Knights of the Round Table, that sort of thing, uh, by a, a French woman named Villeneuve. And there was another French noblewoman who um, reduced that 362 pages down to 17. Her name was Le Prince, or Le Prince. And it was the 17 pages that Le Prince uh, excerpted from the 362 pages that I actually translated and put in the first person. So what came first, the pictures or the words? Well, the words had to come first. And the thing that amazed me, because I've been doing children's books a long time, um, I explained to Chuku how it's going to work. I said, you're going to turn in your version of the story, and they're going to say, it's lovely, it's wonderful, perfect. And then you will crawl slowly across broken glass through hell, mm -hmm. you know, because it will be changes and changes and revisions and revisions, and it'll be nonstop for like, you know, until your mind falls out. And he turned it in, and our editor, Barbara Lilicki, said, it's perfect, it's lovely, wonderful. And then she said, could you make a couple of changes? I was like, here we go, you know? Um, and then he made the revisions, he turned it in, she said, fine and dandy, perfect. And 
And I was like, Ugh. I didn't want him to suffer. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you I, 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 I was shocked. But I think what happened was, as you know, with children's books now, lean, mean text is really popular. Publishers have blamed it on parents. They've said parents don't have the energy to read too long of a story at night. And so they want these lean texts. And I think his years of journalism really helped because he, it was very clean and lean. It had some um, lyrical qualities to it, you know, and a refrain that kept repeating. So it just worked. As the author, you must have a favorite illustration from the book. So which one was it? I bet you know. My favorite is when Beauty returns from her visit to her family uh -huh. when her father was ill and she's put on this her most resplendent dress and she's hoping to make up uh, to the beast for having broken her promise to him to be back within eight days and there's this illustration where she uh, is in this dress and you can see that she's waiting all day long from, from the windows. You can see it's daylight mm -hmm. and it gradually moves into nighttime. She's waiting for the beast who never shows up. Mm. And I thought that was really elegantly done. So uh, when you draw a character, do you draw inspiration from people you know? I don't always include people that I know, but in this particular book, um, and even though he does not see it himself. Aha. Uh -huh or perhaps he's in denial about it. I did use some elements of Chuku when I was doing The Beast, and so others see The Beast in his face. Uh -huh. But it's an homage, not a <laughs> commentary. It's not, it's not. Or maybe around the ears a little bit, the rest yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, I, I saw some of The Beast in him, but um, occasionally I do, and then there are some books when it's all family and friends. Mm -hmm. I uh, have spent a lot of time as an unpaid model. You know, <laughs> 2.30 in the morning when she needs a yeah, certain no. position yeah, or no. she needs something, uh, I do get called upon. And I... Okay, now Rocco, I, I've got to say, okay, we went to this conference one time in New Mexico and they were giving out copies of my books and he was in them. He was the model for some of them. <clears throat> and so I left him alone for just a moment. I come back, he's autographing books. Signing at Chuku, the unpaid model. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay. No, I, I was jumped by these little old ladies. Yeah. I, what, what could I do? I had to sign. You brought some uh, illustrations here from uh, a work in progress, when this was a work in progress. Now, do you use uh, much technology in creating your images? More and more, but I haven't gone completely digital. The um, book that I'm working on now, I attempted to do it completely digitally, and it kind of freaked out my editor. Mm -hmm. So I've gone back to painting, because she said, you can do anything you want, try anything you want. So I tried the digital, she's like, <gasps> you know, do it. I, I think there's um, a reluctance, unless you're really good at it, there are people who really can handle digital medium and it looks like painted mm -hmm. work, you know, like William Lowe or somebody. Um, but I'm still learning. So I use it for things like layouts to figure out what I want to do and experimental things. When What I would do is I would take um, a sketch like this. This was a thumbnail mm -hmm. for the opening scene of Beauty and the Beast. Um, and so then I might work, work it out by doing things I would try it in black and white that I would then colorize on the computer to just get the color scheme, to start working out the color scheme and to add more color. And I tried to do it as just line art where I could just fill it in digitally. That I wasn't too happy with. It felt very flat. Um, and so then I, in the end, I do end up doing just full color. But I use the computer, I must say, to like go in and clean things up. You know, if I spill something on a patch of sky or whatever. Yes, it's very handy. For the cover for this book, I'm sure there's a story. Tell us. We had quite a tussle with that because I felt that Beauty and the Beast should go on the cover of Beauty and the Beast. I thought that was a, you know, a slam dunk, but they didn't want the Beast on the cover. They felt the Beast was a little too frightening. I think I went through like about 70 different sketches to show them um, how to handle it. But in the end, we just went with the topiary that mm -hmm. was representative of a beast. When you were a young aspiring illustrator, do you, did you have any role models? When I got started, I remember I, I looked at everything and I looked at a lot of fashion illustrators um, and a lot of classic painters and stuff like that. In the business itself, I always loved the work of people like um, Tommy DePaolo and Leo and Diane Dillon and Chris Van Allsburg, you know, and 
to be able to see that in a book, I felt it was fine art way back then. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I would pour over other people's children's books. But I remember being influenced by the pictures when I was a kid. Um, just those images in my picture books stuck with me as you know, something I wanted to do. Now, about how many books have you uh, illustrated? About 35, 40. So for each book, you must have a thick file of all your work. Yeah, because all that work material that goes into it, I feel like I need to hold on to it mm -hmm. uh, just to document the working on the book. I have a few uh, friends who are curators of uh, children book collections, and I know when they meet a person like you, they kind of come over and sit next to you and kind of discuss what your plans are for your collection. Do you have plans? I actually tried to get an archive started at the Schomburg, uh -huh. you know, for African American children's literature, but that it, you know, that's that was a lot of work and it didn't work out. I've talked to the de Grum and, and I've talked to there's one in Voorhees and you know I work with the Carl, but you know the truth is I use this stuff a lot because I teach, and so I always am pulling out dummies and sketches right. and things like that. So besides creating books, I teach at Pratt and Parsons. Yes, and so what's the uh, what's the title of the course? It's children's book illustration. How long have you been doing that? Oh dear, long time. I'd say maybe twenty years. Twenty years. It's so a long there, time. there must be at least, hopefully, there's at least one recognizable name from your students that uh, that our viewers may uh, know. There's a lot. David Ezra Stein, who oh. got the Silver Caldecott. David was came into class with a story idea that was it was a story. It wasn't finished, and I said. David, if you have an end to this story, if you can think of an end to this story, I know four editors who would want it right away. And by the time I got home, he had sent me a perfect ending. And I sent it to Barbara Lilicki mm -hmm. at HarperCollins, and she was like, send him up here. So he kind of flipped out because that was, you know, I mean, it was like the second or third week of class, mm -hmm. and I told him, get up to HarperCollins. <laughs> so, well, well, that's a good advertisement for your class. You know, you take the class, and three weeks later, you're, yeah, you're seeing yeah. an editor. It's not everyone that that It doesn't happens. happen like that, but Julian Hector, Julian left Parsons with five contracts. Really? Yeah, from Hyperion and Har HarperCollins. So a lot of the Heroi Nakata, she was one of the first people. She's done like 20 books, at least. Um, one kid from Pratt last semester is getting published by Ferris, Strauss, and Jarrell. Mm -hmm. But he came to the SCBWI conference, he showed his portfolio, and he said to me, like the day after the portfolio show, this woman got in touch with me, and I don't know if it's real or not, but she's at some place called Ferris Strauss and something. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's real, that's real. But the book that he did in class, he's, he's, I think he's just finished it. We just mentioned SCBWI, and for those people watching that aren't familiar, what does that stand for? Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And that's an organization on which uh, you serve on their on the uh, board. board. Yeah, mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about the organization. It's an international organization. It is mandatory for anybody who wants to get into the business because it is a business. And so a lot of people do this because they love it, but you need to get up to speed on how the business works. Mm -hmm. And they have chapters all over the planet. I, I remember being in Germany and I just call up somebody, the German representative, to find out if there's meetings going on. You can touch base with people who are kindred spirits anywhere in the world. Vanuatu, they have a mm -hmm. chapter. Um, so they have these big international conferences twice a year, once in LA and once in New York. And it's fabulous because people do make connections. Editors come, art directors come, agents, illustrators, writers, and it's business. It's schooling you on how the business works, how to get your work out there, um, and also just sometimes on technique, you know, if you're an illustrator, or writing techniques. And it's all ranges. It's middle grade, it's YA, it's everything. If you go to the organization, it's scbwi.org, they have a list of all the grants, all the awards that they give, and information about the conferences, and they have chapter by chapter what the local meetings are going, you know, when they're going to be and what they're going to be about. On top of this, you also run a boot camp. I do a boot camp in the summers. This is, uh, next summer will be the 10th anniversary, and we're going to do something splashy, I think. So what is the boot camp? At every conference I would go to, I would see people who were very close. They had something, but they needed something. They needed a bit of work with it. Or I see my students, and I, you know, you can see the connection just has to be made between what they're doing and getting it in front of a publisher, just refining it and getting it in front of a publisher. So I started this boot camp, which is three sessions, and we just workshop their stories and their artwork or whatever they bring for, it's a, that's a slug fest. It's like six or seven hours for the first workshop. Mm -hmm. And they go away and they work on whatever needs to be worked on. And they come back two weeks later and we meet with an art director. And the art director takes a look, gives them feedback. 
and they go away and two weeks later they come back and meet with an editor. And the editors and art directors who come to the boot camp, it's always somebody high enough to acquire. You know, so mm -hmm. I, every, just every boot camp somebody gets published. Well, thank you so much for being here. It was fun. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Remember, until next time, give a kid a book in any format.